Um, did everybody get a notification that I began recording this time? Yes. I got a pop-up pop -up dialogue box recording, which I clicked on. I did not get a um, verbal. Well, good enough for now, I guess. All right, thank you. Um, welcome to the pre-Thanksgiving CES meeting. Our topics today are module blocks and, uh, uh, and uh, the scope of the default realm. Um, so let's start with you, Daniel. Okay, so I uh, imagine people here have seen the, the module blocks proposal that was presented last GC39 meeting. There are two big, and, and if you haven't, you can find it at uh, github.com slash GC39 slash JS proposal dash JS dash module dash blocks. So the two big questions we have are about the object model and about caching. So let me introduce the caching question first because maybe it's simpler. And the caching question is, you know, the idea of module blocks is they are an expression that returns a module specifier of some form, some kind of object form probably, that we'll discuss what that object is later. And there's a question of when you evaluate a module block expression multiple times. Will the time is. <laughs> Sorry, just a second. <laughs> So will that uh, module block uh, specifier, you know, how will this act in the module cache? So obviously if you, if you evaluate a module block once and you import it two times, you should get the same module namespace object back both times. You'll get like a fresh promise that results to the same module namespace object. But what happens if you, for example, have a function that you call twice that returns a module block which is textually the same, but actually, uh, you know, it's executed different times. Or what if you have two different pieces of code that have textually the same module block, but they're in different parse nodes. So the solution that we're leaning towards based on agreement between V8 and SpiderMonkey was it would be a bad idea to go with either of the template tag, you know, tag template approaches where it was cached by either the contents or the parse node because those presented implementation difficulties. In this case, unlike in tag templates, we don't actually want to do very much caching based on the, the, the contents to, to handle repeated execution. There just isn't that much of a, a use case for you know, rationale for repeated execution of a module block and then importing it repeated times the way that there's for template strings. So I want to propose that it's uncached, that each time you evaluate a module block, you get a distinct module specifier and do... Yeah. I agree. Um, do and people also... have... So it's more like an array literal than it's... It's more like a what? Yeah. And I'm more like an array literal. Uh, I agree. Yeah. I think that it goes beyond that, that it does need to be unique because the location of the mod of the, the refer location of the module will vary um, uh, based off of the execution con may vary based off of the execution context of the module itself. Oh, that's true. But even if it's the same, it still should be different. According to just right. the, the logic of like, we don't actually have a use case that justifies it or like a theoretical reason and it'll just be simpler to implement. So it just avoids one extra piece of friction. Yeah, not, not, only, not only do I agree, but I would have found any other answer uh, to this question on acceptable. Uh, sorry, what did you say? Not only do I agree, I would have found any other answer unacceptable. Okay, perfect. I thought this would be the easier question, so I'm glad we could open and shut this question. What are, what are the consequences? The 
for evaluation uh, inside of an uh, eval? Uh, inside of an eval, so basically, this is the simplest possible form for thinking through what happens inside of an eval because it's just the same as outside of an eval. The complicated thing would be if we did want caching and if it was inside of an eval, then we would have to think through what it means to share a parse node, which is the current state that we're in for, for tag templates. But with this, with these semantics, if it's with an eval, okay, fine. Each time it executes, you get a new. Cool. Sounds good to me. Yeah, there's, it also, cleverly avoids all sorts of problems about being of leaking information through identity of these of, of these objects. Yes. All right, cool. So what's the next question? Then the next question is exactly what uh, you and Mark the were Mark. saying. Should we use the, uh, should this be a static module uh, I can't remember what the name of the class was. My, my yeah, impression is it should be the same class, that we are talking about the same thing. And then the question is more uh, smaller than that, like should we add methods to introspect on the exports of a module here or in this follow-on compartments proposal? So from a specification needs uh, issue, uh, neither of them need to. Um, but the, the compartments proposal is not dependent upon. So from the perspective of the module of the compartment proposal as a module loader, um, a module static record, which is, is, is the, the name is unimportant for the purpose of the conversation too. Um, its interface is an opaque, as far as the compartment is concerned, it's an opaque reference. Um, and it can carry all of its introspection details in uh, internal slots as far as the compartment proposal is concerned. However, we decided to, well, there's provisionally in the proposal as written today, a static imports method, which is, is neither necessary nor sufficient. Um, the, the, it's not necessary for the compartment to be able to use the object and it isn't sufficient to expose all of the information that needs to be, um, uh, that needs to be publicly available if you were to implement a compartment without our compartment. Like yeah, you, you if, yeah. if you were to write a module loader, you would need more information than what we've proposed so far. Uh, only that that all makes perfect for, sense to me. Uh, hold, hold on, let me, let me clarify something. Uh, 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 Chris, um, uh, that's th what you just said is only the case uh, when you want to support live bindings, correct? Um, yes. In, so, in the, in, the in the absence of live bindings, the API that we propose is actually sufficient, which is why we can have uh, foreign module types as long as they implement the API. And so, there are bindings. there are separate layers of the specification. the 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 the, the innermost layer, uh, the innermost layer of the compartments proposal, as envisioned, not as written, is. Uh, uh, is concerned with um, is with concern, concerned only with linking ECMAScript modules to other ECMAScript modules, as would be the case for the static module block, right? Um, module record, the static module record or the module block, oh, one oh, and the same. Got it. Um, I see what you're saying. The uh, the 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 layer there's a layer beyond that uh, that concerns third party module types and does not concern live bindings um, and in that the static in that in that uh, in that proposal it extends uh, it extends the compartment proposal such that it accepts in the place of a static module record or a module block um, instead it would allow for there to be uh, an, a, a, an interface that any object could implement that provides all of the information that would be in internal slots of the static module record um, publicly, um, and then uses that in order to do the same thing. That's really interesting. I, it makes me think about WebAssembly modules where, you know, the WebAssembly JS API has uh, WebAssembly.module as well as WebAssembly.instance. And mod WebAssembly modules correspond, I think, to these module blocks slash uh, mod static module records. 
and then the instances correspond to kind of module namespace objects, right? Because they're they're instantiated with exports. So it does. It seems like we're we're all getting at these same concepts from different angles. I have heard criticism of the module block's name. I haven't heard people suggest what it, what it should be called. I kind of feel like if we call this the static module record proposal, that won't lead to very much intuition about what we're talking about. But it seems it seems really clear to me that we're talking about the same concept. Yes. Yeah. The, the way the um, uh, I think that there's two things that need to be named here that uh, for which module blocks and static module records are, are fine placeholder terms, uh, which is uh, in the same way that we have a distinction between a lambda expression and a closure. Uh, the module block uh, is the you know to my mind the inline syntax. And the static module record is the thing it evaluates to. Um, uh, uh, but so I think that, uh, and that suggests uh, two dimensions of variation. Uh, one is, uh, as we discussed, adding API, defining an API for static module record uh, such that things can serve a static module record in the, the roles of imports and such uh, that are not defined by, that are not created by evaluating static module record, um, uh, such as uh, WASM modules. Uh, and the other one is uh, that even for, uh, um, for regular uh, JavaScript modules that are not in line, that are just on the file system as a .js file, that there be some kind of analog of import um, uh, for obtaining um, not a um, module namespace object or the promise for a mo module namespace object for importing the thing, but obtaining a static module record that represents the thing. Uh, so that the split makes a lot of sense to me. I think if we're thinking about this politically, we know that browsers are scared by, you know, imperative hooks. So if we can decouple the, you know, if we're thinking about this as like chipping away at the edifice of strings are the only module specifier, module blocks where the semantics are based on an internal slot could be like a first step. And then the method protocol, method-based protocol could be like the second step. Does, yeah. that, does that make sense for how we go about this? That, that aligns with our intentions for the compartment API, yeah. Um, also on uh, about the intuition of the name, uh, Mark and I do not, I believe, do not agree about this, but my preference, pardon, not my preference, I would not be offended if static module record uh, were renamed module in order to hint at its correspondence to module blocks. Um, the, uh, like the, the hermetic eval proposal that we made a long time ago um, was, was actually a module constructor function. Uh, that would be very similar in spirit to the static module record constructor and also uh, correspond closely to the evaluation value of a, of a module block. Um, it, it, it was uh, spiritually inspired by the function constructor. Um, and we will need, we will eventually, for the compartment API, we, we, we will need not just, a con, uh, not just a prototype for a module record, but also um, a constructor from text. Um, so a text and location that is, uh, the, the, the compartment proposal will, uh, when, when ready, um, have a static module record constructor function that accepts text and location and returns a, a static module record, record object. I see. Okay. So this all makes a lot of sense and seems like it fits together. Well, then module blocks, having a syntactic thing definitely makes sense to be the first thing that you add before adding the the string constructor. And so this will be kind of paving the way for the for the data model for these later proposals, yeah. right? Honestly, I don't think that the, that particular ordering is particularly important, but it could be politically useful to us, especially considering that the module pro, uh, block proposal is uh, very concise. I think there's just a bunch of superficial stuff to work through of like, okay, now we have a non-string that we're importing and it'll pave the way for those kinds of superficial conversations. Like Jordan already raised some of those in, in issues about brand checking and things like that. Yep. And, and in implementation paths, there will also be these 
these superficial issues as well, where they're used to passing strings and now they pass more things through those implementation paths. Um, Mark, can you answer whether you would object to it, uh, to the name of the constructor being simplified to just module in order to mirror the module block? Uh, so the, the uh, I don't have a strong opinion on that. What I do have a strong opinion about is that the, the name for the syntactic construct and the name for the constructor are, are different things in the same way that lambda expression and closure are different things. It's, it's, it's you know, um, uh, but, um, but yeah, I don't have strong opinions about what the actual name should be. I want, another thing I do have, uh, uh, there's a, a, a nice, um, in trying to specify the module block proposal under whatever names, uh, uh, in uh, uh, ECMAScript spec language. Uh, one of the things that I think will need to be cleaned up and, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing it cleaned up uh, is right now uh, the spec is phrased in terms of these, this awful thing called the module record. Not awful, you know, there's nothing awful with the name module record, but the concept of module record is something that starts off with the static information, but is mutable and then is mutated into being linked and initialized. And the- Yeah, um, I think I, agree, I definitely agree with Mark about the horribleness of, <laughs> of some of the, the way mutation is used in, in ES6 okay. things. So I, I, I agree that, yeah, if we call this module, it's gonna be confusing because then we'll need to articulate a different instance concept editorially in the specification. This is what you're getting at? That's what I'm getting at, and and it can be, and, and that doesn't mean that we have to choose a lousy name. It can mean that the you know the the internal spec names are not exposed in API. So that's actually the things that are least costly to change of names that are already out in the world. Um, and if we're going to do a major refactoring of the spec anyway, uh, then having the uh, rationalizing the names in the spec so that it works with where we want to go, I think is is a nice thing to do. And the refactoring by itself to set us up for this uh, could be something that itself has no observable, um, uh, you know, no observable consequences, and is therefore just goes through the committee as a PR rather than a proposal. So yeah, I, I, about the module name, I'm a little bit concerned that it could be confusing because uh, I don't know if people have a good way of thinking through the gap between a module, you know, the module record and the, the instance in conversations with, with developers that, that tends to be a point of confusion when describing module blocks. Mm -hmm. yep. I, think, I think we just have to do more discussions and try out different names in small conversations to figure out what will be an, uh, a clear way to describe it. Yeah, I would Before we can conclude right now. I also wouldn't be offended if, uh, if static module record got picked up. Um, it says, would yeah. be fine either way. WASM uh, does use the term module for the static concept and module instance for the linked and instantiated concept. Uh, that's at least officially. Uh, uh, the way people speak when they speak about WASM stuff, uh, does that, um, did they stay unconfused about that? I mean, WASM is a is a different kind of target audience because you're mostly talking to toolchain developers about these things. Okay. Good point. Um, I think that we should call time on this topic and move on to um, realms. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, Karidi, I believe that uh, where we are is what is the scope of what should be on the default realm? Okay. Um, so, Daniel has some ideas around, uh, around these. Uh, in the past, we just to give a quick history around it. In the past, we considered that. It is in the control of the uh, author or the creator of the realm to decide what goes there. And the realms were created empty with a global, global object being empty. And a set of descriptors were given to you. And you decide from those descriptors, which one do you want to install as a global reference? Um, we dropped that a while ago. 
and we went with whatever is specified in 262 plus the warning around what can what what can the host do in case that they want to add more things to it. Um, and I feel that uh, the there is also now the pushback from implementers saying that well there are fundamental things from the browsers that we would like to see there. And I think the sentiment is more like, well, there's a clear distinction now between the web and the language. Mm -hmm. And they don't like that idea. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic with that. Uh, the question is, uh, where do we draw the line about what goes there and what, what doesn't? And, uh, and the, Daniel's ideas of trying to organize this group of APIs that are more common um, uh, seems like a good idea. There is a precedent here uh, with the workers and workers and such. So what, what should go there? We don't know yet. So I, I want to give some more kind of political context to this. In the discussion about uh, built-in modules, the big objection that we heard from browsers about the split namespaces was that it would require developers to know about the layering of different APIs in web versus JavaScript specifications. Now, I, I think I agree with Carity that even if everybody doesn't know this, it's kind of somewhat widely held knowledge. It is a thing about the layering and about the world, but we have this kind of design constraint being, being given. Uh, I think the, there's a difference between this scenario and the, the built-in module scenario, which is that the built-in module system is, is meant to be used by developers sort of all the time directly, whereas realms are used more by a framework to set something up. But uh, I get the feeling that they still consider this bad. So the... The line that I was thinking, actually, this was proposed by Anna Van Kesteren, Mozilla. I mean, he proposed a few different lines, but one line was basically things with text processing are in, maybe simple things to work with. Uh, there's this function Q microtask, which is basically like promise, make a new promise, and then dot then, and just very basic things that could have been specified in JavaScript are in, but things about events or especially input and output or things of high complexity would generally be removed. So we would be, we would try to have this common feeling categorization because the, the set of things that are included in various different web contexts is, uh, they try to have a, a logic to it. So that would be what we, what we would do here, but Ideally, the set of non-JavaScript things included would be small and easy to emulate. I mean, a requirement, I think, would be that everything must be possible to emulate with just JavaScript. So let me, let me ask some so, questions. Let me ask some questions. Um, uh, would all of the things on the table here be something that whose, whose meaning is not tied to being on a browser that would actually be um, uh, something that would be uh, useful to appear on other hosts. Um, uh, the, the example that uh, uh, Chris and I have, have, have used in bouncing around things is like text encoder, text decoder is clearly useful on any host. It's, not, it's, it's utility is not tied to a host. Uh, and then the other uh, one is- Yeah, I think, I think so. I think that should be a requirement. Okay. And then uh, the other one is uh, are all of these things powerless uh, in the sense that um, uh, if you transitively froze uh, the, the primordial form, um, uh, that there would be uh, no loss of intended utility uh, and that they don't provide uh, any hidden mutability or IO access to the outside world? Uh, I agree that that should be a requirement. Okay. Well, uh, so that, that touches on a very interesting one, which is the fetch. And I think fetch is a, a 
complicated one because it is in workers, it is in node. It will not be in a realm if, if, if we follow this principle. Mm -hmm. And but for you to to add it to the uh, that that was one of the things that Annette also mentioned, like what about fetch and IO? And I think for us it's, it's easy to just make that distinction that IO and things that might cause some side effect will not should not be there by default. But I don't know if that will be sufficient for them. So I wanted to also. Oh, the, brainstorm a little bit on what what kind of compromise can we have that could unblock this um whether that's multiple Wait. constructors or something like that yeah. or or configurations or options and uh, we should look at this from the perspective of okay well um the the end user what what will the end user do with this api Wait, before we game out uh, further ways that we could allow more things, can we establish a baseline of if something meets those requirements that Mark mentioned of it doesn't, it's, it's powerless and it's meaningful and useful across environments, then that, then that would be a meaningful thing, that, that would be a reasonable baseline. Do we, do we agree among this group that we, I mean, another example was like base 64 encoding and decoding. So let, let me agree let me that sure. so 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 I, so before I say yes, let me let me elaborate what what I I mean by baseline here, uh, or I would like us to mean by baseline, uh, which is that the TC thirty nine realm spec mandates that those things be included um, uh, 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 for realms across all hooks. It's part of the language to include them, and that doesn't mean the TC thirty nine has to. Um, uh, you know, engage in a, in a you know, jurisdictional turf war over who standardizes text encoder. TC, the TC39 spec does delegate to other specs, for example, with Unicode. Uh, we could likewise say that text encoder is part of the standard shared globals according to the language, but the, uh, but the spec that we're referring to for what the text encoder is uh, we could still cite the W3C spec on the definition of text encoder. But I think that all of the things that end up in this list should be a list that's standardized by TC39 as part of the JavaScript language. Um, so I, I think I think there's a, a, a list of problematics here. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to, to bring to understanding, we have a... a so uh, some uh, some implicit agreement at TC39 and at this group, um, bear with me, that what we want is just the primordials, like from ECMAScript. Um, we are trying to accommodate and make room for what we want in the integration uh, of HTML, which current problem is a uh, challenge like getting HTML uh, to accept uh, integrating with realms. And we are trying to make room. And I think we are, uh, we are in, in our most, uh, in our best faith, uh, trying to be considerate like of what should be going or not. I think we should be clear on, at one point at TC39, this proposal is like uh, implicitly good for us. I think there is another problem. If we try to make a list of things outside of TC39 that should be in the, the realms proposal, um, this will create a room for uh, Dominic and, uh, uh, and other people to say like, oh, TC39 should not be discussing about this. And this should be uh, extending the challenge for much longer. I think like our understanding with with realms is like we can uh, we should uh, for TC39 for realms at TC39 we should be deciding if we should curate this room uh, for extension or not, and we should be creating a decision with the HTML uh, uh, integration saying what should be included or not, like going specific. But like for TC39, 
we should just be deciding should we uh, allow realms to to have more uh, global properties i think this is much simpler of a problem and uh, helps them block in blocking the proposal easier also like it, it allows us to investigate how the, uh, the the api is good enough without many things rather than as like I, i've been collecting some internal feedback uh since the meeting and uh yeah as one colleague has mentioned like it's better if we go through evolution rather than revolution uh i think it's starting so small is good it's starting like what we have today is good we should be considering like what to be added in the html integration so so i, I, I agree with I, leo's political sense i believe that uh People in Chrome, in a in a set of people in Chrome that's broader than just Dominic, even would would take Mark's proposal as exactly that, exactly as a, a turf war, and oppose it on those on those grounds. If we wanted to enumerate a list of things, I wonder if we could do an intermediate thing of writing in the JavaScript spec the requirement for our expectations for the kinds of things that will go on a realm, and also ensure that we have clear documentation somewhere for what we expect to be on it, but maybe not like literally specified in the specification. Because I think it would be very, it, it's very difficult to traverse all of the different web specs and figure yeah. out what should be on the global object. So I think yeah, if we I, maintain I, okay. a document ourselves that contains this list and we say, look, we, the realms champions, take this to be the list, but this is not a document that we're asserting to be a, a standard and then the standard says more like the high level expectations okay. yeah, so this I could be I, like an intermediate path so yeah I'm, the, the, I'm definitely not the, the fine i'm not definitely the, this is a common trend so i i, I think uh, I'm, I'm on uh, i i agree with daniel and and, and in the sense of defining the criteria for the things that should go there uh, is a far better approach than defining the list of things that we believe should be there. And the the criteria, I think, uh, what Mark says, and we have been talking about this for a while, uh, seems to be a good groundwork to start defining or consolidating that criteria. I still have concerns about how we how that criteria will hold up based on the current specification. And to be very more specific, the IO uh, is a thing that uh, concerns me because the realm do have IO capabilities. Um, uh, those IO capabilities came in a form of a module uh, import. And so saying that the things that are added to to the realm do not have IO or should not have IO is already violating by just having the ability to do import. Well, that's true, but module imports are a very specific kind of IO. I think right, we also might be able to say like the only IO that's expected is, is for module imports. That's a coherent thing that we could say. So I so so um, so I appreciate political constraints. Obviously, we um, uh, we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out how to work around them. Um, but I don't understand how the stance that you guys just seem to agree on uh, what it accomplishes. Uh, when I say new realm, and I'm on a browser, I get things that were not browser specific that were safe to include on non-browsers and therefore um, uh, would not have harmed me if they appeared when I said new realm on non-browsers, but we're not making them part of the realm standard that they be included. So if I'm on a non-browser, these things that are equally useful and equally non-browser specific, when I'm on a non-browser and I say new realm, I don't get them. That doesn't seem coherent to me. So I, I think we talk about Mark. We talk about this in the past, uh, specifically. Uh, I was trying to make clear that the realm 
uh, proposal is not going to give you a, a, a full standardization or a full uh, virtualization infrastructure. No, no, sorry, that's the wrong terminology here. It's not going to give you a platform for standardizing the code across different environments because there always be difference between those environments, even the language itself. Like it might be that in Node, we don't have certain features that are already implemented in browsers because they were implemented in browser first. And therefore you don't, you still have to do feature detection. What kind of capabilities are available to you when you create a new realm? It's not that the realm gets defined and this is the API that you get and you can trust that API. You can add things to it. You never get something new. You will get difference between environment uh, all the time uh, okay. and having extra APIs provided by a particular environment uh, is just an add up onto that where you might get things that in other environments you don't get and you have to polyfill if you need them or you have to figure ways to not use them because they might not be available in other environment for you. So I think that's the reality that we live today and it's just the same thing that we have today. Can you give some other examples at the language level of what you're talking about? Yes, I get it. let's say that we, we, we don't have in, in one environment, we don't have, uh, well, Ray Buffer is probably not a good example, but let's say any of the new newest API that we have been adding to the language that are not available for you in Node yet. Uh, so what I, do you do about that? Can I give that? an example? Uh, so, I mean, aside from versioning, there are things like with import assertions, import assertions on the web will be required to load a JSON module, but on Node, it might be optional. And on some bundlers, it also might be optional or some module sort of uh, virtualization systems. So you will have the, potentially have a mismatch just through the, the import, dynamic import or static import statements when you execute them within a realm because the environment is the one that it, that interprets the the import uh, assertions, and same with the module specifiers themselves. The module specifiers are executed within their their host environment. These are all. These are all by virtue of. Um, Post hooks that we expect to be virtualizing eventually, um, uh, post post you know after the the realm the realm proposal itself, um, uh, the and in any case these these examples were are for proposals that are in process so the degree of divergence between environments is not yet settled and it's still opportunity to reduce unnecessary divergence. Can we give an example of the existing language? Yeah, Daniel, any, any of the new globals that we have been adding recently? I mean, uh, one example is Intel or non-Intel environments. Okay. You know, Intel is, is optional. And okay. if you get into a new realm, okay. Yeah. Now, are you just convinced now or what? Uh, I think it's an interesting example. It certainly stretches my understanding. Uh, so the thing that's interesting about Intel uh, is that uh, it's there as a all or nothing bag that can be feature detected. Uh, and it's there uh, 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 as a potential thing to, to see across all environments. Uh, it's obviously any host, any separate host standard can mandate whether it's mandatory or absent, um, uh, but uh, ECMAScript does specify it while allowing the, the, the bag as a whole to be normative optional and host independent manner. Yeah, so uh, overall, I, I, I'm pretty sympathetic to Mark's concerns about not adding IO things besides module loading. I'm wondering if our next step could be articulating this uh, in a PR to the realms proposal and also in a change to the HTML uh, integration PR to say these requirements on what gets added and on HG in the HTML side, do a survey 
of which globals and which functions meet those requirements and mark them as, as exposed. But based on requirements being listed in the realm spec rather than the listed APIs. Yeah, it's kind of a loose relationship. We define in one side the, the criteria in the other side, we define the interface that matches that criteria and we add it to the HTML spec, well, the things that needs to be in that, in that interface. The, the, let me just roll back quick to just a, a little political point. Uh, I think this plan is great. And one of the things that is missing here uh, is actually uh, engagement uh, from the HTML maintainers. We are trying to bring them like our requirements, but they are still not like solid on what they want for acceptance and we need to push them out to, to actually give a position. Uh, my first so understanding I, I think from- Anna, if, Anna's if, been uh, available. If you want Daniel. to engage, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I just want to give like, my first perspective from Anna was, is, I, I was really going to mention uh, Anna right now. Uh, my first uh, point of view is that Anna just like wanted to cut uh, uh, any requirements, but actually like cut down, like in uh, not being able to add anything. While Dominic was basically saying the opposite, Dominic was concerned with the separation of what is uh, uh, like that we are now showing to the web developers what are the uh, ECMAScript or modules, differentiating them from uh, web uh, the web API. Um, so they're kind of like they, we're going on the opposite directions. And uh, I hope when you present your requirements for them to engage in a solid position uh, where they are at. And I hope they get like some concise and unified uh, position on that for integration. Because what we want is for them to show us uh, some direction as well to find the consensual uh, uh, progress. Like showing the requirements and not asking them to engage to really tell like where the, that list should be going would not result in anything. We we need to force. Well, I, them I disagree. To, to I disagree. I think. Okay. I, I think I think if we define the criteria, not only the criteria, and we go and do our homework of defining the interface and what things we believe fits into that criteria, we go there and say. What do you think about this model? Do you like this model? Do you agree with this model? And then we go into, do you agree with the criteria? Is it the criteria um, too narrow? Do, do you want to expand this criteria? And we can engage into that conversation uh, as, as, as well as looking at other APIs that might fit into that criteria that you want to bring it in, into so the HTML spec. Karidi, we don't disagree. I was actually trying to say exactly this. And that, like after we present, we ask them what they think about it. Uh, like what, what they, um, so it's exactly like, we don't disagree. I, I'm glad it was just a misunderstanding. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. If I... <laughs> okay, sounds like we have a really solid plan here. Uh, should we assign action items for like, there, there are sort of three parts to this. One part is writing the, uh, the spec on the realm side to permit the uh, addition of globals, but with these requirements. One is to do the survey on the HTML side to figure out which APIs would actually be exposed. And the third one is to do the editorial work on the HTML side to make sure that WebIDL works with realms and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I can take the, the, the uh, I can work with Mark on the criteria. We have that somewhere, I believe. Um, so we can dig it out and, and try to formalize that and get Mark's buy into it. And, uh, and then we can try to update the, the spec to highlight that. I don't know what kind of artifact we want to add to, add to the spec. Uh, where are we going to add? 
this wording saying that you are allowed to do this. I think uh, that's going to be in this uh, synthetic hook. That's where I thought it would be. Okay. Yeah, after finishing all the operations there, saying, and uh, the host uh, in, in normative node or, uh, or something that can define the criteria, okay. Oh, I wanted to also mention, should we make the, the global object be an immutable global prototype global object, the, the global object of the new realm? So that again? Should we make the global object of the new realm be an immutable prototype global object? Immutable prototype global object. An immutable prototype exotic object, the way that object prototype is immutable prototype and the web schoolable object is immutable prototype? No, because then how you emulate the web. If you're going to emulate the web, you have to change the proto chain of the global object with all kind of ah, stuff. Okay, right. So it had to be an ordinary global object. Okay, if you could explain that on the issue where we're discussing this question, that would be that would be helpful. Uh, I miss. I have a, a long list of issues that came back two days ago, and I have a long list. I haven't. I haven't get to that one. You send me the link. I, I look at it today. So, okay, so how are you this, feeling sir? about this plan, Mark? Uh, I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, uh, the um, Having there be more coordination on what the list ends up uh, as of the things that are included um, uh, that that do meet these criteria, but what the what the actual list of those names are and what specs they cite, uh, I would like to minimize. Um, I would like to get good coordination somehow about that across hosts so that we don't get unnecessary developer pain where you know I'm on node or I'm on XS and I say new realm and then new realm.global.text encoder and there's no text encoder but text encoder was powerless and host independent why is there no text en text encoder here that seems like just you know, unnecessary developer pain that our criteria already enables us to avoid. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I, I agree we need more coordination. I uh, started a repository a couple of years ago at this point to try to promote this coordination. Unfortunately, I got it mixed up in this uh, built-in modules debate, <laughs> which became very ugly. But I think, uh, I think politically people would not, people would be happy for us to make that, but we have to say that we have to be not asking anybody for permission to make that list. Okay. We, have, we can make the list, we can talk with the people to coordinate it, make sure everyone's on the same page and have documentation for developers and, every, and implementers and everybody. But we don't have standing to say, this is a standard right out of the gate. Maybe we'll be able to build that standing over time, but people are skeptical. So we just have to start by saying it's documentation. Does that seem like an okay frame? That seems excellent. That seems that, that really addresses my issue. My issue is really not um, that I wanted to really stand on the distinction between de jure and de facto. Uh, my issue is really that I just wanted there to be a standard set of safe, harmless, host neutral globals that developers could count on um, uh, to minimize unnecessary developer pain. And having, having it emerge as a list that, it, that, as a list that achieves de facto status seems fine. Yeah, I 100% share the goal, that goal. And I'm also kind of remain concerned about the kind of sloppiness that, that web standard work can sometimes be, where it can be hard to tell what's a standard and what's where. And I think we can address this, but I think we also have to 
wait a few years before we can start using the word standard when we talk about this list. That's fine. Because first, first we have to establish that it's a, a reasonable thing for us to document and proceed incrementally on. And then we can start saying like, okay, it's a standard in this, this venue. Yep. Yep, that sounds good. Okay, I'm, I'm very, very excited about that project. I'm really glad to hear that you share that, that interest. Good. It looks like we're pretty, we're, that we're over time. Um, the, uh, is there anything we wish to discuss before we uh, close the meeting? I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>